Welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I'm glad to be back in this sunflower house. And today's podcast is on dry eyes. In fact, I needed to put eye drops in my eyes. Just reading over the material was making my eyes dry. It's such a common problem, especially amongst midlife women's health. And a lot of what I'm going to be discussing is really nicely encapsulated by a terrific column on our website, the nonprofit, speakingofwomenshealth.com. And it was authored by one of our graduated specialty women's health fellows who I hope to be able to recruit back to the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Tiffany Cochran. <clears throat> She's just a fabulous woman. She's an internist and a women's health specialist, and she is practicing internal medicine and specialty women's health and seeing patients right now at Port Royal Medical Center in Port Royal, South Carolina. She's originally from Alabama and she is such a well-mannered Southern uh, lady and her patients just adored her. She got her Bachelor of Science from Valdosta State University and her doctorate in medicine from Morehouse School of Medicine. And she also has a Master's of Arts in Healthcare Administration. And I really hope to interview her live um, later in the month on uh, women's health, hormones, blood clots, DVTs. She authored an excellent chapter on this. She's also authored chapters in osteoporosis and menopause. So a couple of her columns I think we really need to highlight, and one includes dry eyes. Now dry eye disease is a really common reason for needing to see an eye doctor like an ophthalmologist or even an optometrist or even your general physician because it can lead to eye discomfort, lower eyesight, and a reduced quality of life, particularly for people over age 50. And dry eyes affect over 350 million people worldwide and over 50% of all perimenopausal and menopausal women experience dry eyes. Dry eyes, dry skin, dry mouth, dry vagina. And this disease can impact the quality of the tears leading to overall poor eye health. Um, and if you don't treat dry eyes, you can get a higher risk of eye infections, abrasions, inflammation, of the eye structures, which can lead to damage to the cornea, the front surface of the eye. And this can result in eye pain, ulcers, even permanent vision problems. In fact, one of my girlfriends who has this cute Boston Terrier, Napoleon Bonaparte is his name, um, and he's got a big personality and he's a little dog. He apparently was uh, attacked by a pit bulldog and got a corneal ulcer and was in danger of losing his vision and so they had to set an alarm clock around the clock every four hours to put eye drops and ointment to save uh, the dog's vision and luckily he's much better. So we all have to protect vision. Your eyes are very important and any kind of trauma, infection, uh, pain, drainage, um, foreign objects need to be taken care of right away. In fact, I, I remember my husband uh, telling me, oh, just go ahead and treat, you know, your two-year-old son, Emerson. He's got another ear infection. You know, let's not take him to the doctor. You already know what it is. And I'm like, no, I'm not a pediatrician. I think we really should take him in. And we all thought that he had an ear infection. He actually had a foreign body in his cornea that the pediatrician astutely picked up. So in children who aren't that verbal or, you know, can't necessarily describe what's wrong with them, you know, also including pets or elderly people or anybody with any communication skills, uh, you have to be alert to symptoms that actually might be from the eyes. So getting back to dry eyes, what are some of the causes? Well, there's a lot of different factors that have uh, been elucidated. Certainly, autoimmune diseases are right up there, and women suffer from more autoimmune conditions than men. And some common autoimmune conditions uh, that can cause dry eyes are Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, which is inflammation of the blood vessels from an overactive immune response, systemic sclerosis, also known as scleroderma, 
and also uh, people that have primary biliary cirrhosis, which is autoimmune, can also cause dry eyes. Lots of medicines can cause dry eyes. Antihistamine, beta blockers, diuretics, uh, antispasmodics like baclofen, uh, and flexoral used for muscle cramps or muscle disorders, bental used for irritable bowel syndrome. All of these can lead to drier eyes. Certainly uh, different antidepressants, especially some of the older ones, the NSRIs like amitriptyline and nortriptyline are notorious for dry eyes. Vitamin deficiencies can also trigger dry eyes as well as contact lenses, seasonal allergies, lower humidity, high windy uh, areas, certain types of outdoor job exposures, and of course aging. Um, we kind of get drier as we get older and have less fluids. Now there's other reasons that one can have dry eyes if there's something wrong with the mebobian glands. And anytime that the blink rate is lowered, there can be drier eyes because when you blink, you actually stimulate uh, some movement of the tears. And it's thought that perimenopausal and menopausal women produce less androgens, which we know that they do just with age, and women have much less androgens than men. And that can cause fewer secretions from mebobian uh, oil glands, as well as lacrimal tear glands in the eyes. The mebobian glands produce essential oils for tears. And if you have less oil in your eyes, um, you just have less tears. Now, estrogen plays a critical role. And women can experience dry eye symptoms at certain times of their monthly cycle. Dry eyes can be a side effect of certain hormonal contraceptives, especially if they lower the androgen levels. Now rosacea is a common condition and we'll do another podcast on rosacea and other skin disorders that are so common in women. But rosacea is a skin inflammatory disease that can affect not just the face, the nose, but also the eye anatomy. And serious eye problems can develop even if the rosacea on the skin is pretty mild. So ocular rosacea is a relapsing inflammatory condition of the eyes and its structures. And it also often requires continued treatment. Now, remember, this is not medical advice. We are just empowering you to be strong, be healthy, and be in charge and understand common conditions that might, that might affect you or your family members or your friends. And rosacea is a frustrating uh, skin condition, and particularly when it affects the mebobian glands. Um, and if there's scarring of the opening of these gland uh, orifices, sometimes there's also telangiectasias or dilation of the blood vessels, the eyes can become very irritated and dry. And unfortunately, sometimes ocular rosacea is overlooked because people think the eye symptoms are simply allergies or problems from contact lenses or contact lens solution. So 50% of all people with rosacea will develop symptoms in their eyes. And when I see someone with rosacea who doesn't have eye symptoms, I just remind them of that. And really anyone over the age of 50 should see an eye doctor every year. So what are dry eye risk factors? Well, we told you female gender is certainly one, being over the age of 50, having any kind of connective tissue disease, like Sjogren's or rheumatoid arthritis, use of contact lenses, which are very popular, uh, medications, including the diuretics, the antihistamines, the antidepressants, as well as Accutane, isotretinoin, which is used to many times give acne cures, dramatically reduces oil gland secretion. People who've undergone bone marrow transplant, any person with lower testosterone levels, as well as, of course, perimenopause and menopause. I get a lot of calls from patients saying, oh, their eye doctor said that, you know, their hormone regimen is causing their dry eyes. And I think sometimes it's a little bit misinterpreted. Certainly being low in hormones or having a hormone imbalance may make that predisposition or condition worse. So what are some of the signs and the symptoms? Well, swollen red eyes are common. There can be bloodshot eyes. Um, and I think using things like Visine, which just cause vasoconstriction, aren't really a good idea. Um, if there's pink eye, it can be a sign of a viral or bacterial infection. 
and you need to seek medical attention. Uh, there can be crusty eyelids or eyelashes. In fact, my cat, my cute, elderly, almost 19-year-old uh, ragdoll kitty cat, she, every morning I would clean out her crusty eyes, and once I got my air filtration and duct system cleaned in my house, she has no more crusty eyes. So really good quality air that's also humidified, and she likes to come into my bedroom and put her little face and whiskers right in front of the humidifier. But come to think of it, she really doesn't do that behavior now that we've cleaned out the air, uh, the air ducts. Getting back to symptoms, there can be burning, itching, sensitivity to light, blurry eyes, or feeling like there's a gritty sensation or foreign body in the eye. Anytime there's any recurrent eyelid infections, you need to worry about these mabobian glands and the tear ducts. <clears throat> so certainly, if you have these symptoms, talk to your primary care physician. Um, you might need to see a dermatologist or an ophthalmologist. So what are some of the treatments? Well, the main goal of treatment for dry eyes focuses on restoring the tear production. And so you might need to approach it from multiple different ways. Eye hygiene is very important. Using a very soft, like baby uh, washcloth with maybe some baby shampoo and warm water gently washing around the eyes. Warm compresses can help improve oil and tear production, keeping your eyelids clean and applying a warm cloth or pad several times a day may be recommended to keep the debris away and the gland ducts open. Be careful not to over exfoliate though because that can really irritate the skin. And if you're in front of a screen like many of us are in front of phones and computers and electronic devices, take some breaks, blink frequently because we do know when people are on the screen they don't blink as much. And blinking does improve tear production. Protect your eyes. Wear sunglasses with UVA blocking uh, to block harmful sunlight. Um, also, really dry, windy uh, conditions can be hard on the eyes. And avoid triggers like pollen. Um, listen to one of our prior podcasts on allergies and pollens and physical things you can do to your home. Try to avoid smoke, bad air quality. In fact, I am are recording this at the end of June of 2023, where many areas of the country have had dangerous air conditions because of all the uh, uh, Canadian fires. Uh, in fact, you know, on a beautiful day like today, the kids in the summer camps were inside because of the air quality. Alcohol causes dehydration and makes a lot of things worse. Uh, heat dry air, certain cosmetics. Um, you know, the eye doctors usually recommend changing your eye cosmetics anytime there's any eye irritation or infection and um, just regularly getting new um, uh, eye makeup. Again, considering that humidifier to moisten the air around you, I use one year round. Exercise, light aerobic exercise might actually imp improve tear production. Many of my patients say they don't have any dry um, eyes during the day when they're moving around, but they get it at night. Certainly you should eat healthy foods, Mediterranean type diet, rich in omega-3s, and avoid processed foods, sugary foods. And getting enough vitamin A, which is a real vitamin as, a, as opposed to um, vitamin D, which is a prosterol hormone, you can become toxic on vitamin A, so you need to avoid anything more than twice the upper recommended daily allowance, especially pregnant women. But vitamin A is good for the eyes, so it's in foods like carrots and pumpkins and squash, yellow and orange uh, foods. And omega-3 foods, which we'll have an upcoming podcast on omega-3, they also help with tear production. And some women find that higher doses of omega-3 really do help their dry eyes. Now, it's extra calories. It can sometimes cause breast cysts and breast tenderness. So I think you really should get a physician's uh, advice before doing that. Now, there are many over-the-counter uh, lubricating eye drops and ointments. Um, artificial tears in the form of drops or even thicker ointments can provide some relief for dry eyes. 
They can maintain the moisture in the eyes. But in general, if they can make ocular rosacea worse. So again, you need to see your physician. Generally, drops should not be used more than four to six times per day because if you're exposed to a lot of the preservatives, it can damage the eye surface and lead to conjunctivitis. Preservative-free artificial tears are less irritating to the eye surface and can be used more frequently. And because they don't have preservatives, they're usually like in single application. Autologous serum tears or platelet-rich plasma can be a treatment option because it contains both anti-inflammatory factors and growth factors that can help in treating dry eye disease and support healing of the eye surface. Now, tetrahydrolazine, uh, which I had mentioned earlier, the vasoconstrictor that narrows the blood vessels, um, can lead to rebound redness with chronic use. Um, so in general, I, I don't recommend it. Now, there are some emulsion formulated eye drops uh, that replace oil to tear production, which can help reduce the evaporation of just the liquid um, H2O water. And so these emulsion formulated eye drops might be a great choice for people um, who have the blurry vision, and sometimes it actually improves people blinking. There are lubricating eye gels um, and ointments. Generally, they're used at night because they can cause blurry vision. Steroid eye drops, corticosteroid eye drops, um, sometimes are prescribed, but they're only prescribed generally by um, ophthalmologists because they can cause drug-induced glaucoma, which is an increased pressure of the eye. They can increase cataract formation, uh, especially if they're used for more than four weeks. So it should be restricted and, and generally not routinely used. Hormonal-related dry eye treatments. Um, it's a little bit debatable about using systemic hormone therapy because we don't really have consistent results. I think it's kind of individual. Um, certainly, there is um, some studies in using androgen uh, formulations uh, in patients um, showing some improvement. So I think that's something for us to watch in the literature. Um, some medications can reduce eyelid inflammation, uh, including antibiotics. Um, so sometimes antibiotics are used not to treat bacterial infection, but to actually reduce inflammation. And a common one is doxycycline, which is a tetracycline-based antibiotics, and it can be used daily uh, for up to six weeks. If someone is tetracycline um, allergic, occasionally erythromycin or azithromycin are used Certainly, these antibiotics, especially doxycycline or any tetracycline, cannot be used in a pregnant woman because it can affect the developing baby's teeth. There are other anti-inflammatory prescription treatments. Uh, one of the first ones was Restasis, which is topical cyclosporin, and that acts to increase tear production due to eye inflammation because it inhibits the activity of certain inflammatory immune cells in the lacrimal tear ducts and glands. Topical ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic medicine uh, and cream can be applied to rosacea face and eyelids and dramatically reduces inflammation. Zidra is the brand name for the generic uh, lifidograst, which is an ophthalmic lymphocyte function associated antigen one antagonist, an LFA one antagonist. And it's an eye drop that reduces inflammatory cell binding, meaning less eye inflammation. Some of my patients say it really burns when they put it in their eyes, and so they refrigerate it to make it cooler. That can be more soothing. I've had some patients prescribe these expensive eye drops who find that just by doing humidification, getting their hormone balance in order, doing the appropriate eye hygiene, and using the preservative-free eye drops they're able to not need prescription medicine. In terms of devices, there's scleral contact lenses that are large rigid lenses that sometimes give a temporary reserve for tears or ophthalmic medications that sometimes eye doctors might prescribe. Um, there are procedures occasionally that might be recommended. Surgery 
might be recommended for people that have abnormal eyelid anatomy or function, people who can't totally uh, close their eyes to protect the cornea, like people who have seventh cranial nerve palsy, Bell's palsy. Corneal transplants or grafts are possible for severe dry eye disease. Uh, but again, that's not something that we normally um, do. Occasionally, a plug is placed in the lower lacrimal gland. It's either silicon or collagen to block the tear ducts because the tears that are made stay in the eye. Um, and it reduces the drainage of tears to the back of the nose. Now, my uh, oldest son, Stetson, uh, when he was born, he had um, blockage of his corneal uh, ducts and actually had to have surgery because they were hard like cardboard and he always looked like he was crying. And his daughter Artemis, my granddaughter, had the same condition, but massage uh, opened hers up and, and she didn't thankfully need surgery. Um, so we sometimes do the reverse for older people um, who otherwise are not responsive. There's another therapy called intense pulse light therapy that might be considered as a treatment for dry eyes caused by ocular rosacea. And this treatment requires direct application of light in various wavelengths to the skin. But this is pretty new. We don't have a lot of long-term research on the effectiveness and safety of therapy. And certainly we do like to have long-term data but it's very irritating for people with dry eyes. I think you need to stay on top of it. You need to talk to your regular doctor, perhaps even a dermatologist or your ophthalmologist if you're suffering from any symptoms of dry eyes because we want eyes that are comfortable and attractive and appropriately moisturized with good vision because that's part of us being strong, being healthy, and being in charge. So thanks so much for joining me in the Sunflower House. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, the Executive Director of National Speaking of Women's Health. Please subscribe to our podcast if you don't already. Anywhere you get podcasts, there's podcast apps on your phone or computer. It's free. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a five-star rating. And we'll see you back in the Sunflower House.